I need a new chair. Welcome back to my channel. My name is Maddie. If you're new here, I hope your day is going well. And today we're going to talk about Butcher and Blackbird, which I kept calling Butcher and Blackbeard because for some reason my brain and TikTok famous books, book talk famous books, doesn't work with the titles because this was the same thing that happened with Fourth Wing. I kept calling it Darkwing Duck and for some reason this book I kept calling Butcher and Blackbeard because a serial killer romance named Butcher and Blackbeard sounds better than Butcher and Blackbird, so that's a hill I'm gonna die on. Um, mostly because pretty much anything could have been better than this, and I heard a bunch of great reviews for it. I actually took the recommendation from a TikToker that I really like. I don't know what their name is, though. I have no idea what, no idea what the username is, so I can't even, like give them the credit for having recommended me the book uh, because the one thing with TikTok is that I'll follow people for months and have no idea what their like usernames are at all. Like I have to save content on there or else I will never find it again. It's a very strange conundrum but I'm not going to even really give them credit because I don't want to give them like any hate or anything like that. I just heard from a account uh, that I really really liked that this book was good and it's not, <laughs> which I wanna just be clear. I went into this book thinking it was gonna be good. I even talked in my Discord about how I thought the trigger warnings were hilarious. Um, they, uh, this book, I think, thinks it's really funny and it's just mostly cringe where that might work for some people. It certainly didn't for me. So let's talk about the most recent book talk darling, Butcher and Blackbird. Coming off strong, this is about serial killers falling in love. And that to me sounded very intriguing um, until I found out that it was very, very boring and executed pretty badly. Let me tell you what happens. We open the story to our main character, Sloane, damsel and distressing it inside a cage with one of her victims that is being slowly eaten away to the tune of a thousand maggots. How did she wind up in this situation? We don't know. We won't find out. That is going to be a running theme of the story. But then our hero in what should be prison issue armor strolls up. Yes, I did reuse that joke from my Haunting Adeline review. I think it's a good joke. This is my video. Sue me. His name is Rowan, and I, as I was writing this script, had already forgotten his name. And I do think it is quite funny because I did not remember either of these characters' names because, as we will find out, this story doesn't actually care about the main characters all that much. Um, and it's pretty easy to understand why they're not really the focal point, if you get my drift, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So in this interaction, Rowan shows up, strolls up to this woman in a cage, and starts grilling her about her identity. And not like who she is as a person, but who she is as a serial killer. And he starts going through all of these lists of serial killer names, and I just have a little thing to say to the people that are obsessed with true crime in this way. Stop it. The made up names for serial killers in this are A, ridiculous, and B, incredibly disrespectful to the people that are victims of serial killers. Here's the thing, if you've read the book, I know what you're saying right now. These two aren't actual serial killers. They kill the bad guys. I cannot express to you how that dynamic just doesn't work in this book at all. This was pitched to me as a serial killer romance, not a Dexter slash you fan fiction. I have not seen either of those shows, by the way, so I have no idea if that joke lands. Hopefully it does. The way that I can describe this is it feels like somebody watched Dahmer, ordered an Eat Me Daddy shirt, and then wrote this book. I just can't believe that we live in a timeline where people want to fuck serial killers. Okay, I'll get off the high horse for a second and get back to the story. So Rowan gets uh, Sloan out of the cage and goes, take a shower. Where are they? No idea. Uh, we're gonna burn this house down and then go get barbecue. Sound like a plan? That's what they do. Do we see them commit the arson? No. That would have been far too much crime on the page to actually warrant a moment for that. But what we do have time for is Rowan getting completely distracted by the fact that Sloan has nipples. Homeboy just becomes completely non-verbal while they're sitting in a restaurant and knowing that she has 
memories. Just can't contain himself. She's not wearing a bra and he cannot function. Now here's the thing, I have been reading and reviewing books for a long time and I don't think that Bryn Weaver, she named her main character the Orb Weaver as the serial killer name that she chose. But she used her own last name. That's the weirdest definition of a self-insert if I've ever heard one. What I was going to say is I think this book has a lot of potential. It just focuses on the wrong things, specifically this romance having no stakes and no tension, and these adults talking like teenagers, if not younger. We'll unpack this a little bit more as I go along. The one thing about this book is that there is an insta-love trope that just hits really fucking hard out of nowhere. Rowan falls for Sloane in seconds. And then over the course of the novel, we're supposed to just assume that they can't be together, but there is no concrete reason why. There are two consenting adults that have similar interests, just happens to be killing people, but they, for some reason, refuse to act on those feelings for no reason. Like, if these two characters had been developed more and their backstories actually felt more nuanced than just tragic backstory, I think I might have enjoyed this book, but it was just a lot of quippy one-liners and really, really awkward banter that a lot of people seem to enjoy, but it just didn't work for me whatsoever. On the topic of very strange relationship dynamics and gendered norms, this is what Sloane says to Rowan when they are about to eat their food. Well, be prepared, pretty boy. My stomach has been eating nearby organs for the last three days, and I'm going to devour these fucking ribs in the most unladylike fashion possible. Because apparently nearly starving to death in a cage still prefaces the need to warn someone about your table manners when you're about to eat the literally messiest meal possible. Additionally, they also order beers here and then don't specify the beers, and I know this is a nitpick on my part, but I'm willing to bet these people drink Coors Light. Offense intended. The unladylike component of Sloane's character becomes a running joke for her because she's the orb weaver, which basically means she likes to pluck people's eyes out, and then I'm guessing she puts people into this like web of stuff. I don't really feel like we ever got a clear description of what either of these people do to the bodies of their victims. But I'm okay with that because I don't think it would have been handled very well. But the thing about her, Sloane's MO, so to speak, is that she plucks the eyeballs out of her victims' bodies and she has to make a point of saying that she doesn't gouge them because that's not ladylike. The issue I have with this character choice is that if we had some groundwork done for Sloane's backstory that means that she has a reason to defend her femininity like this, I would be fine with it. But there isn't a reason for it. I don't even really feel like we get the full context of Sloane's backstory because it ties in too closely to another character that I think is going to be the main character of the next book. So most of the time she's just being a not like other girls girl but also being like I'm a lady which feels a very dated and boring character choice for her if there's no groundwork to stabilize it on, if that makes sense. One year later! So there's a bunch of time skips in this book that I feel like were completely unnecessary. When I first heard serial killer romance competition, I thought it would be like they had to go do research and find the serial killers and beat each other to get to the serial killers. That's not what happens here. They, for some reason, don't have to do any sleuthing to figure out who any of the people are that they're gonna go kill. It's actually one of the weakest points of the book, and I get it. This is a serial killer romance. It's supposed to be just fun smut, but like, the laziness that goes into the mystery on this part is just so frustrating. So one year later, we have had no change in either of these characters, no character growth whatsoever. And they are now going to reunite and find a serial killer that's killing people out in Washington State. 
Why is it always Washington State? I don't understand. It's like, I don't get it. Sloane hasn't heard anything from Rowan about the gang because she's just waiting for instructions, sitting by her phone while also torturing a guy on the table and also on the phone with her best friend, Lark, who happens to know everything about the fact that she's a fucking serial killer. Once again, my expectation of this was supposed to be that they were like gonna be serial killers kind of working together in the shadows. And it was gonna be like a serial killer, how to lose the time war, but I will not bring shame to Big Liz Dickless's name in reference to this fucking garbage. Speaking of dicks, Sloane can't get Rowan's out of her mind. I bet it's such a pretty dick too. Too, just like the rest of him. Jesus Christ, I need help, I hiss. Girl, if you are thinking about someone's genitals in this way, there is no more bad you can be down for. You found the bottom, found a trap door, and then kept fucking going. So once again, she's impatiently waiting by the phone, and so begins the text exchanges. And I have never been more annoyed by text exchanges since Fifty Shades of Grey email chain thread things. Um, I don't get why authors think these are necessary to move the plotline of the story because texting in real life is a great way for miscommunication and it just seems to do the worst in novels as well, but I digress. So these two start texting each other. At worst, they sound like AI horny teenagers and at best, they, they're just derivative of like millennial cringe. Um, they're basically going back and forth like, you're the worst and you said my face is pretty. And I just don't understand the fact that the tension between these two has to be manufactured on the audience's part because there's no reason why these two couldn't just talk to each other. They don't really seem to have any interest in common other than murdering people, but the fact that they don't talk to each other about stuff is just really confusing at best. And the fact that there's no tension between them and they both find each other attractive means that the audience has to make up this assumption that they can't be together. And honestly, that's not on the audience or the reader's job. That's on the author. So Sloane is talking to her best friend, Lark, who, as the book puts it, never fails to chime in with a random but relevant movie line. Which... Okay. This is where I start, started realizing that this book was not going to take serial killing in any way seriously because why does your best friend know you're a serial killer and has no problems with it? Like, I don't know about you guys, but if I found out that my best friend had a hobby of killing people, I would make like a tree and leave. From that scene, we have Rowan talking to his brothers who also know he's a serial killer. So instead of having these two have to do any work to find people. Rowan's brother is just finding them for them and he calls him a masochistic little bitch because he's trying to make sure that Rowan fails at the competition. And I don't know about you guys, but like, I don't talk to my siblings that way. And I, it just feels really uncomfortable. And once again, gendered language um, that just feels gross. I want to pause the video and say, remember, if you leave a hate comment down below, I get more views. Moving on. Sloan and Rowan end up meeting up in the middle of nowhere, Washington, at a seedy little motel, and they hang out in the lobby like assholes at like 2 a.m., drinking wine that Rowan stole from the kitchen, I guess? It's kind of a weird situation. And so they're teasing each other back and forth, right? Because they're fucking mature and... Um, Sloan happens, it's, Sloan is my cat's name, so it's really, really confusing when I'm using that name. Sloan is, uh, reading a dragon breeding smut. Remember for that for later, because it'll be on the test. Um, and, uh, of course, you know, Rowan's giving her shit for that, which naturally, honestly, good for him. That makes a lot of sense. Also, by the way, Rowan, he's Irish. Hasn't been relevant until now. I don't think it ever actually becomes relevant, but I do know that the audiobook has been getting really good reviews, so I'm wondering if maybe the narrator has an accent. Might have improved my reading experience just a little bit as well. So once again on the gendered language part, this is where Sloan tells Rowan that, he, that he's getting his boy germs and man pox all over the wine bottle, and it's just... Do people talk like this? I don't feel like I've talked like this about guys 
like having cooties since I was like 11. Like I still think men are gross, don't get me wrong, but like not that they actually have boy germs, you know? Like this type of flirting isn't funny to me and I know that that's just because I don't particularly think that gender stereotypes are funny anymore, but like maybe we should be adults about shit? I don't know. I. <sighs> It's just, it's just not, it's not my cup of tea. So the guy who's running the hotel pops up and goes, hey, you guys are hanging out at 2 a.m. Can I help you? And they're like, oh, sorry. And so he picks up the cat whose name is Winston Churchill. And I'm now going to go on a tangent that should not be in this video, but I want to talk about it. Back in 2020, I watched an entirety of your grandfather's World War II documentary. When I say your grandfather's, I mean that this documentary had like several episodes and was very much made for someone who would sit in a big armchair, watch about five minutes, and then pass the fuck out. I watched all of that back in 2020 because I needed a reminder, a cathartic like outlet to remind myself that times had been worse. And oh boy, when you're watching a World War II documentary, that is exactly what happens. So as I'm watching this, I start seeing Winston Churchill pop up. He always looks like this. And for some reason, I could not separate this man from a harbinger of doom. And that's why I think the fact that this cat is named Winston Churchill in this book is hilarious. Tangent aside, let's keep going. To speed run this, of course this random dude that owns the motel happens to be the serial killer in this area because why would we make anybody work for anything? We find this out because dude is listening to Sloane masturbate in the wall of the motel and we find out this information because Rowan is also listening to Sloane masturbate through the wall. And then off on a merry chase, Sloane catches up to him first, Rowan yells at her, and so Rowan ends up winning the competition because she stops and lets Rowan take the guy out and he beats him until he's um, dead. By the way, bear in mind YouTube, these are all fictional characters, this didn't happen. This whole interaction is very he-man, my woman energy and I'm just so confused because Sloane, you let him win? Look, I don't know if it's like my Virgo rising or something, but I do not give a fuck if my honor's at stake. If there's a competition, I'm not allowing a man to win. A win is a win and I'm standing on business, as the kids say. Also, additionally in this particular segment, um, throughout actually the whole book, there is a phrase that's used as any sane person would do, followed by something no sane person would do. I jump on the hood of his moving car. I sleep with my boss. I hit that dab. The way this phrase is used, it's approximately funny once. And then after that, every time it popped up, I was like, okay, enough. We know they're not sane. They kill people for no reason. They don't have like any self-righteous qualities, either of these main characters to explain why they feel the need to get revenge for other people, even though they don't need to do that at all. And most people would find killing people a, a weird hobby, but these guys seem to treat it like they just go out for a stroll, a little hawk or a walk, and then accidentally murder someone along the way. Also, the cringy, weird dialogue and the behavior from both of them is just not distinct enough for them to have two voices. So I think that's why I just conflate these two characters into one, because I just don't feel like they're distinct enough to sound like different people. Six months later. You know what I did this morning? Deep sigh. I decorated my toaster strudel. This is apparently not a sex thing. I don't even know if the author realizes it's a sex thing. They have to realize it's a sex thing, right? Um, but like this, this whole bit played completely straight over text message. Don't understand, but did you guys see the video of the guy that like put this type of shit in his wedding vows that went viral on TikTok? Men just be doing gross shit to embarrass women and this was not one of those things. So people out there must like it, I guess. So speaking of like drama and men being gross, let's talk about Lark and her fascination with men who will beat the shit out of someone for you to defend your honor. It's like wild because Roland, Rowan, Roadkill, 
he was also listening to Sloane masturbate. Like, he was doing the thing that he then murdered someone because of. Like, he was doing the thing that you didn't want someone else to be doing, but because he's the fucking love interest, it's okay? Because bear in mind, there has not been any proof that, like, they found that distinctly linked this bed and breakfast owner to the killings in this area. So the only crime he seems to have committed was being slightly pervy, that Rowan also committed the same crime. So they may have just murdered this random dude without actually knowing if he was the bad guy or not. Fucking ridiculous. So the conversation between Lark and Sloan about guys that are like willing to beat a bitch for you goes very much along the same lines as the idol scene where uh, where one of the girls goes, he's kind of rapey, and the other one goes, yeah, I like it. Which is just not the way people, I think, interact with each other. I don't get this. They also compare him to Keanu Reeves in a movie that just feels so dated for this book. Constantine didn't come out in the last, like, almost two decades, I'm pretty sure. Um, but Lark has this to say about the people that she has been hanging out with. I'm in a dry spell. You'd think there would be some hot musician types on the road, but they're all way too emo. I just want to be tossed around a bit, manhandled, you know? Call me a dirty little slut, and I'm all for it. These cry into the mic types aren't doing it for me. Ma'am? This is a Wendy's? It's very clear that this book is being set up for Lark and I think Lachlan is Rowan's brother's name um, because the main characters of this book are like set dressing almost for the amount of character development that they're getting. Whereas Lark, for some reason, has a lot of time spent into like kind of showcasing how weird her interests seem to be. Um, and this particular like offset just feels aggressively like Vampire Academy or like all of those like 2008 really like alpha hole like <laughs> no alpha hole I'm sorry I just read Crescent City stay tuned for that um it just feels weird to read this in 2024 like I don't get why this is still attractive to people that's when I read these books I'm just like we make fun of books that usually say this from like 15 years ago but it's showing up here and a movie that isn't relevant at all. And also, how can you say that Constantine is P. Keanu Reeves in a universe where John Wick exists? I'm sorry, that's just wrong. Three months later, Sloane shows up to Rowan's work unprompted, like a stalker. He's a chef, by the way. Um, I don't know what type of restaurant it is. It's like a meadery or something. Oh, he's a butcher. I'm fucking stupid. So she pops a squat at a table and orders a cucumber margarita to both my and her confusion. It's true, I am nervous and weirded out, not only by the drink option I apparently just ordered, but by this whole scenario of being an intruder in a space that feels too sacred to bend to my obsessions. What the ever-loving fuck does that mean, ma'am? This is where I feel like a copy editor should have gone, we don't need this to say this. Because no one's internal monologue says shit like this. And if it does, I'm sorry, maybe I'm just projecting. But when I'm sitting alone at a table in a restaurant that's owned by the guy that I'm stalking, hypothetically, my inner monologue would probably be like, this is awkward, this is awkward, this is awkward, this is awkward, I shouldn't be here, I shouldn't be here. Not, this is too sacred to bend to my obsessions. Like, it's a, a sentence that like, objectively, if you're not thinking about it too hard, makes complete sense, I think. And then if you think about it, even a little bit, everything falls apart from grammar to like sentence structure, just doesn't make a lot of sense. Also, I don't know if a cucumber margarita would even be served at a steakhouse or whatever the fuck this place is supposed to be, um, but I wanna try one. So Rowan comes out of the kitchen and basically throws a fucking fit. His brother shows up and he walks in, Lachlan, who is basically just Rune from Crescent City. Um, and then Rowan is like yelling at his waitstaff for not telling him that Sloane was in the building. And he acts really weirdly about her. I, I, I don't know, like he's just a weird character in general because if I saw 
a guy that I liked or a person that I wanted to date interact with their employees in this way because they hadn't been notified of my arrival, even if we were dating, like I just feel like that would be a deep crimson burgundy red flag because why are you yelling about something that no one was prepared for, sir? Could you stop throwing a tantrum for like five minutes, please? And then to end this beautiful miscommunication trope off beautifully, a character named Anna walks in. She's apparently like a leggy blonde. I don't really know. She goes up to Rowan, seems to have had history with him, maybe? Um, and so Sloane dips immediately because she's like, oh no, I've put him in a weird position and now there's a girl involved. And I'm just like, I don't understand why people do this. Like, first of all, this character, to my knowledge, doesn't come back. Is never referenced again. Couldn't tell you what happens to her. At all. But also, like, Sloane just fucking dicks off after having made everyone really fucking uncomfortable for having been there in the first place, but she just continues to just not ask Rowan any questions about who anybody was. She just leaves and then ends the entire scene with a banger of a couplet. Because revenge is easy, but everything else is hard. Like, I just, I don't understand because at this point, she doesn't need revenge on anybody. She's not getting revenge for anyone she knows, but for some reason, she just can't have a fucking conversation. Everybody needs to go to therapy. And then from there, we have one of the more nonsensical parts of the book, which is pretty impressive considering the shit that we've dealt with prior. So Rowan, despite having a job and a business that he, I'm assuming, should be like working at, um, decides to fly back to wherever Sloane lives, park outside her house for a week while paying a neighborhood kid to leave groceries on her door and then walking her through how to cook the groceries that he sent her on the phone because she doesn't know that he's outside her house watching her. But it just begs the question, why can't he just go in and cook the food for her? Just miss me with the cooking shit. If someone delivered groceries to my house and was like, I'm gonna tell you how to cook them on the phone. I would throw them away and order Uber Eats out of pure spite. Maybe I would even just make the food and then give it to a neighbor just on sheer principle. That principle being I'm a bitch. I just don't get it. Like this is not cute to me. I don't know about you guys, but I just don't find a guy sending you something and making you learn how to cook via phone I don't, I don't find that, I don't find that cute. I don't find it cute. Also in this scene, there is a reference to the Madonna Britney kiss that I'm just genuinely confused why it's here. All of the pop culture references are dated. They're not relevant. I'm almost 30 at this point of filming. Um, and I'm a little too old for the Madonna Britney kiss. So the people, like the actual ages of the characters, I'm not sure if they're supposed to be in their 30s, but they're definitely most likely too young to just casually mention the Madonna Britney kiss. Let me know if you're anywhere between 20 and 25 and you know what I'm talking about without Googling it in the comments down below. So this whole, weird montage of them making food ends in a pretty perfect way with him just ghosting her. <laughs> Serial killer pun. And she tells him that she can't cook without him, which... Come on. Now it's time for the next serial killer game, game, serial killer game competition. The premise of the book. The culprit this time is Thorsten Harris, which good on ya, that is a good villain name. He's rich and likes to eat people. I'm not joking. It would be nice to have known how this information was uh, gathered, but we don't get that. Not even a little bit. You just put Sloane and Rowan on Unsolved Mysteries and they'll have everything done in like a day. Sloane somehow ends up having lunch with Thorsten and Rowan crashes it. Somehow they end up having, getting invited to Thorsten's like own restaurant for dinner. And then uh, Rowan gets drugged, starts professing his love to Sloane, eats some human meat that he doesn't realize is meat and then falls smack first into the table. That's a very long scene and sequence of events, but I'm not going to go into the in more depth because I don't want to. So Rowan comes to and Sloane is slicing up Thorsten, which we did not see her take on a full-grown man. 
because that would have been too interesting and too difficult for the author, I can expect. Uh, we just have to assume that she's just really good at this whole serial killing business. Like, fuck me for thinking we would see the serial killing on the page. That's a reference to the first Crescent City review, where I said the sluttery should be on the page. <laughs> But just in case you're worried about Rowan, he has this to say about Sloan in 2.5 seconds after he wakes up. My dick hardens just imagining how the curve of her ass would feel in my hands, the softness of her flesh in my palms. Around here is when we find out that Thorsten lobotomized a guy and has been having him work around the restaurant. Winery thing? I don't know. I don't care. And according to Sloane, this dude is living his best non-cognizant life while shoveling cum ice cream down his throat. This character is where the book fucking lost me. So just at the mere mention, from what I can tell, Rowan gets viscerally sick because of the concept of cum ice cream, which is really weird because like flash forward a couple of scenes when they're having sex, he hoovers her dam and then baby birds it into her mouth. So I'm not really sure why he's so freaked out about the concept of what cum tastes like, if you know what I'm saying. The kicker of this whole scene though is that they start trying to figure out what to do with this guy who's been lobotomized and is a serial killer victim. Um, and the decision they come to is just to bring him home with them and have him work in Rowan's restaurant for free. I cannot express to you how stupid I find that. First of all, I've just watched a little bit too much How to Get Away with Murder and taking the guy from your last victim's site and taking him back to your home, just that, that's a bad plan. Um, and additionally, like maybe just drop him off at the hospital, which was an idea that they had. Like just drop him off. He needs to be cared for. I will say there's one very like unironically funny line in this scene where Sloane tells Rowan that he's her best friend, which, okay. But he responds with, okay, cool. Do you want to go do karate in the garage? And like they don't end up doing the karate in the garage, but that's like unironically kind of funny. Eight months later, we find our murderous maiden talking about her memories with her best friend Lark, to which the author tries to use a Gen Z phrase that I just don't think is understood or applied correctly, but correct me if I'm wrong. You have murder too. He likes that. I roll my eyes and stare her down through the screen. Boobs plus murder don't equal a relationship, Lark. That math ain't mathin'. Then this is followed up by Lark doing one of these like trope pet peeve like pep talks where a character basically tells the main character how good of a person they are because for some reason we don't have the ability to show that they're a good person. We just have to have another character very randomly just decide to tell them they are. You listen to me. You're amazing, Sloane Sutherland. You are brilliant and so brave and loyal to the ends of the earth. You set your mind to something and you fucking get it done. You work hard. You're funny. You make me laugh when I don't think I can. Not to mention your smoking hot, gorgeous face, gold star tits. I'm going to vomit on everyone's shoes. Hey, maybe it's just me and I don't trust compliments, but if this is what a healthy friendship looks like, if someone said this to me, I would laugh directly in their face. But also now at this point, Sloan has seemingly forgotten that they're actually in a competition and is like, oh, well, I owe Rowan a win. And I'm like, what? No? The two lethal lovebirds end up on a date and Rowan mentions that she needs to get a oil change for her car. Um, and he does the weird Christian Grey like domineering thing about like trying to make sure that like the masculine things are done for Sloane. And I just don't really understand why it's cute and sexy to like be bad about remembering to take care of your possessions as a woman. Cause like we're all individuals and I just don't feel like it's hot for a guy to be like, I'm gonna get your oil changed. No, sir, I can do that myself, thank you. Four months later. So they're going after this guy who's basically Bubba from the Chainsaw Massacre. Like we literally are just scraping the barrel for ideas at this point. But I have to put a note in here that neither one of these characters are righteous enough to do this. Like it just feels really strange that they're going after people with 
no real reason to do so. There's this really great book, I don't know if you've heard about it, but it's called Vicious and it's by V.E. Schwab, that handles this type of character incredibly well. There is a character in this that even though he has powers, he thinks that the powers are a sin against nature, basically, and he's going out of his way to try and murder people with powers. And he's doing it in a way where you can't argue with him. He really does feel that what he's doing is right. And that is where I feel like these two characters are trying to be that, but they just don't come across strong enough to convey that what they're doing is right. They should just stop doing it and go to therapy. I think this is another case where, like, because shows like Dexter exist and books like Haunting Adeline have basically made this a trope where, oh, well, I hunt the bad guys, so I'm not a bad guy. It's just not good writing. Neither Rowan or Sloan have the motivations to make what they do makes sense and we just have to roll with the fact that they're doing it because we've seen it other places so I guess that's fine then. I can't root for these characters, they have the depth of a fucking Vegas kiddie pool in July. But back to the Bubba storyline, so Sloane gets captured, don't worry, Rowan got her out in 0.5 seconds and she has her collar broken in the process and even though they're like kind of about to maybe get murdered, they have time to start making out against a wall while also leaving another one of the victims to potentially die. And then there's a really weird interaction between Sloane and Bubba where she kind of pretends to be his mother and there's a lot of weirdness regarding just m evil moms in this part. Nine months later! No, nah, I'm just kidding. Uh, we go from that scene, um, I don't even remember how they got the other girl out, but we go from that scene to meeting Rowan's other brother who happens to be a veterinarian and also has a crazy random lady living with him. This character reminds me a lot of the random tangent character in Haunting Adeline where she shows up, you could remove her completely from the storyline and that would not change anything to do with the plotline whatso fucking ever. This interaction where <laughs> Uh, this woman who's living with uh, Rowan's brother, um, I guess, uh, basically uh, assumes because Sloan has a boot print on her face that Rowan hit, kicked Sloan. And so she flips out on Rowan and then we get this gem. He's more of a converse guy. Of course he is. I'm gonna blow chunks over everybody's matching converse, okay? This is a self attack. I am also a converse guy. Also, this random chick reads tarot, because of course she does. Guess the tarot cards she pulls down below in the comments, and if you get them right, you'll get a cookie. Considering that we're about halfway through the book at this point, I guess we need to get some schmexy times in, you know what I'm saying? Uh, Rowan tells Sloane that he likes her bruised face, which y'all be into what you're into. Uh, Sloane says that her bruises look like the color of an eggplant, which means we end up with her calling herself mushy dick face. Thanks, Obama. The writing is just chef's kiss. Here's the thing, I can forgive a lot of cringy sex scenes depending on if I like the characters or not. In this, I don't like the characters, so the sex scene is ass. But there was something I wasn't prepared for, which is Sloane is a veritable pincushion of piercings, especially on her, um, down under. Can't even really describe to you what piercings she has because I know for a fact it'll get me demonetized, but just so you know, I had to Google some placements because I was unaware that you could put so much metal down there. But also she got them for making sex more pleasurable for her and her partner, but she doesn't sleep with anyone? Like she meets Rowan and it's been fucking like at least a year and a half, if not more since they met and she has not had sex with anyone else? Ma'am. <laughs> Seems like a waste of investment if you think about it. But moving on, there's at least one good girl in this scene so now I'm shitting in everyone's converse. But that scene that I mentioned earlier about the hoovering damn bir baby bird, that, that happens here, just so you know. Swallow. He calls it an appetizer three seconds later. I also think it's interesting about this this genre of books. It's like once you get your characters in the sack, it's like impossible for anyone to have erectile dysfunction, much less 
have them stop fucking for like 10 seconds. Conjunction junction, what's your function? Like the hero's job is to do nothing other than be a jackrabbit for like an entire night. Like we do the flip it, reverse it, backdoor with no ass training, whole shebang on the very first night. YouTube, leave me alone. Bear in mind, the entire time, Sloan has a broken collarbone. And then they move in together and everyone is happy happily ever after. There's like 30% of the book left. Fuck my life. Also, by the way, they took the guy's cat. <laughs> Did any of these people understand that you shouldn't take mementos from the people that you murder? Like they're animals or they're invalid victims? Speaking of that individual, um, we have to have a very strange miscommunication trope for the third act breakup where the lobotomized guy just gets magically cured? Question mark? Um, and then holds Rowan hostage and so and tells Rowan to tell Sloan to to leave him? unclear like this guy just like woke up and chose violence towards rowan specifically um and then there's this very stupid showdown between him and sloan and i just ooh, i don't like it i don't like it and the person that's like specified in the acknowledgments as having condoned the usage of a lot of lobotomized person um this is your fault this was not good i think it's pretty fucking egregiously ableist at the bare minimum um but uh yeah didn't love it at all. And to wrap this up in a mega cringe, disgusting bow, Rowan proposes to Sloane via a ring in a eyeball socket that was plucked out. And then following that, there is a after credit scene, basically, I think it's a bonus story, where he fucks her in a dragon onesie with a double dildo and yeah. I will say the last scene is kind of funny, just ostensibly. Um, if I like the characters, once again, I might actually have enjoyed that last scene. A little bit weird if you ask me in a lot of ways, but uh, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was not good. It's not a fun time. Let me know down below in the comments. Are you a Converse or a Vans guy? I'm gonna go now, guys. Like, subscribe, all the good stuff. Bye!